Hello again, everyone, and uh, welcome back to session two of our Marine Money Istanbul virtual forum. As I said earlier on, we're all very sorry that we're not uh, enjoying each other's company in Istanbul overlooking the Bosphorus, but uh, this is what we're able to do. We're very happy that we're able to do it, and uh, we're planning ahead already for 2022 when hopefully we will indeed be able to be in Istanbul. Session two is focusing on the macro issues affecting shipping in Turkey and in the world. And we have a wonderful uh, panel um, to, to discuss all these in, in, uh, issues. I would first like uh, to introduce our moderator, Dr. Shadan Kaptanoglu. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have uh, Shadan at our Marine Money events. Shadan, of course, has been representing Turkey for many years as director of Kaptanoglu Shipping, and more recently has been representing uh, the global shipping industry as uh, president of BIMCO. So Shadan, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Uh, I'd like also to introduce Mr. Esben Paulson. Uh, Esben is based in Singapore. Uh, he's chairman of NSL uh, PTE Limited, but also representing global shipping in his uh, position as chairman of the International Chamber of uh, Shipping. Uh, I'd like to say uh, hello to Mr. Mustafa uh, Mutaroglu who is a member of the Turkish Chamber of Shipping and also a board member of the International Bunker Industry Association. We also have uh, Mikhil Steeman. Mikhil was for many years with uh, DVB Bank um, in Singapore and elsewhere, and now is managing director of uh, Zuderze uh, Capital based in uh, Holland. Uh, we have Salih Zeka Shakir. Uh, uh, Salih is a ship owner in his own right but he's also president of the assembly of the Turkish Chamber of Shipping. Thank you, uh, Sali, for joining us. Okay. And we have Mr. Mark O'Neill. Now, Mark is president of uh, Columbia Ship Management based in Cyprus. He's also president of, the, of Intermanagement. Um, so again, a global representative of shipping. Uh, and uh, it's a, a fun, actually a wonderful panel with wonderful representatives, both of individual countries and of global shipping. So we're extremely happy to have you all here. With that, um, and you were just before we start, I mean, during the discussion, you have the, if you're listening in, you have the opportunity to ask uh, questions. Uh, there's a little uh, space on the screen. You can see it here. You can just write your questions in that box on the right hand side in the, in the kind of info bar. I will then take those questions and at the end of the session, we'll ask two or three of those questions on your behalf. Uh, also on the uh, screen, you may be interested in, a, in the, uh, the, the where, where it says handouts. We have some handouts there about marine money. We have today's agenda. Uh, we have uh, our um, schedule of events going forward. Hope We hope that many of these will be physical events later in the year. Uh, and also we have a, a brochure uh, about uh, marine money coming together again. Like I said, we're delighted to be here. We have a fantastic panel. Uh, Shadan, over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Is everyone can hear me? It's okay from me. Wonderful. Okay. So welcome everyone to Marine Money Istanbul event. event. Uh, this panel we focus on the macroeconomic issues that currently affecting shipping. And also we will discuss about the Turkish shipping and its competitiveness. Uh, I, I am very honored to be the moderator of this esteemed group. And before uh, we start to discussion, uh, I will briefly outline uh, the situation that uh, I think we are facing right now. Overall, the global economy has progressed better than was expected at the start on the, of the pandemic. This is certainly the case uh, for the some shipping sectors, which have been able to profit from the stimulus measures many governments have rolled out over the past year. The International Monetary Fund forecasts that the global economy will grow by 6% this year, bringing it back up to the pre-pandemic level. This achievement would not be possible without the support of the extra government spending we have seen since the pandemic began. Unfortunately, the global recovery is and will continue to be uneven, both geographically as well as across industries. Over the course of the past year, the pandemic and the measures put in place to limit the spread have devastated some industries while leaving others relatively unharmed. 
to a certain extent. This has also been the case of shipping. Tanker shipping is still struggling with the effects of lower oil demand. On the positive side, the recoveries of major economies around the world have provided a boost for dry bulk and container shipping. Stimulus in China and the strong US retail sales due to the US stimulus have been great for shipping. However, with service reopening, the share of spending on goods, which is all important for shipping, will fall. Globally, the recovery will be uneven again. It will reflect how able, how able governments are to spend their uh, way out of the crisis and it will reflect their access to vaccine and ability to deploy the vaccine. I'm afraid the path ahead to a new normal we see both winners and losers and it may shake the global relations further. And yet still we are going through unprecedented times and I think during the pandemic we learn a lot of things. And also we see that pandemic act as an accel accelerator of some of the issues. For example, we learned that our global supply chain is not resilient. I want to clarify what I mean, because in shipping, we did great. We did a great job, but to the cost of our seafarers. So during the post COVID, we should deal with, the, with this and be sure that our great industry is resilient. Pandemic also accelerate our response to climate change. So it is not possible to talk about macroeconomics uh, of shipping without talking about environment, especially the decarbonization of shipping. Ship owners are committed to decarbonization of shipping. But I have to say, this is a very complex matter. After saying all this, I, I know that I am not optimistic. I never be an optimistic. Also, you know, being a BIMCO president also kind of give you uh, always responsibility to have a balanced uh, outlook. But I, we are very, very lucky today because we have this all value, valuable panelist. And uh, I will be uh, dividing the conversation, if possible, to two. We will start with microeconomics and also the Turkish shipping and its competitiveness, and then maybe we'll go to the environment uh, issues. And uh, and I will also start with the international uh, friends we have. And uh, Esben, we are. I'm very happy to see you here. Welcome and thank you for participating. What is your you. opinion on the microeconomics and? Uh, and also, you know, what do you think that how the world will be post-COVID and where the Turkish shipping, you know, find its place? Thank you. Well, Sadan, you, you've uh, just made uh, such an excellent introduction that contained pretty well most of the points <laughs> that I was hoping to make. Um, so either we have the same briefing people or, or whatever, but no, I, I think you, you, have, you have laid the groundwork very, very well. The fact is that, to the surprise of many, uh, I think you could say, the, the fallout from this crisis hasn't been as bad overall as one would expect it. There's a lot of distortion, and unfortunately, as always, in terms of national relations, there's haves and have-nots. The, the developed economies um, have, through, as you rightly said, um, enormous amounts of money being pumped into their respective systems. Um, you know, save their their populations, relatively speaking, from the absolute harshest aspects um, of what this crisis brought. But nonetheless, you would have to think that uh, money printing is a fine thing. But but to me, I maybe I'm very old-fashioned. But money printing, I, I cannot believe, is sustainable forever. And there must come a time uh, when it when it has to stop, and when productivity and economic activity will generate sufficient funds whereby governments can start taking some of this money back into their coffers again. But at the same time, when, when you look at the resistance there is to tax rises, in particularly in the developed world, it, it, I find it a bit hard to, to see. But 
But as you rightly said, the, the forecast of the IMF is for a 6% um, global economic increase this year and 4.4% in 2022, which are, you know, by any measure is, is pretty good. But it is, I think it is a little uh, distorted because some countries are way, way, way behind that. And that just leads me on to the, the impact of the vaccine, of course, is really everything now. Um, and not least, we in shipping owe it to do everything we can to, to make sure that our seafarers are, are near at the top priority to be vaccinated. I know that BIMCO is working on this, we are working on it, and all the associations, um, we are trying very hard to see what we can do to help this process. A lot of owners, of course, are, are doing what they need to do. But, um, but if I could turn to Turkish shipping, uh, you may have seen that um, ICS did an international trade study recently, which actually I, I, I can't say it's over 100 pages. I don't pretend that I've read every page, but I did look up the reference to, to Turkey. And I found that, um, that Turkey ranked as number one in the world in respect of entry and licensing and was ranked 18 out of 46 in the overall prime index. Uh, the report specifically highlights Turkish naval forces strategy, which underlines the importance of, quote, marine structures, shipyards, ports, marinas, navigation, safety of life, property and environment at sea, maritime education, culture and tourism, R&D and marine technologies. So therefore, it's pretty clear that, um, that there's strong Turkish government support for shipping. And as, as I understand it, Turkey uh, controls about just over a thousand ships of which around two thirds are foreign flag and about one third of Turkish flag. I know from some of the boards I sit on that we've had a tremendous number of dry dockings in Turkey over the last uh, six to 12 months. And so I would imagine that the, I, I think the, the shipyard industry has been quite buoyant to, to this crisis for, you know, for obvious reasons. So, um, and finally, I must say we had our ICS AGM um, at the Four Seasons and the Bosphorus in uh, 2017. And I have to say, it's just one of the most fantastic um, locations and occasions that I've, I've ever had the pleasure of joining in my many years in shipping. So thank you. Edwin, thank you. Uh, and uh, I think uh, as, as a BIMCO president, president, I just prefer to speak, you know, international so to not to favor my own co uh, country but um, uh, I also see that you know Turkish shipping come to a certain maturity uh, but uh, uh, I will leave it to later because we have an, also an expert on this and Sally Kaptan will, will talk about it more. Uh, now I want to just go to Mark and Mark uh, first of all congratulations once more for Inter Manager and uh, you are you are leading one of the leading ship management company. And what is your insight on macroeconomics and you know how it will be uh, post COVID? Thank you. I, I I'm thank you, Shadan. I'm I'm all for being uh, humble and and to the extent I can offer any um, opinion on uh, macroeconomics, I, I think it's uh, as follows. I think the world uh, economic forecast for growth is one thing, but I think that ignores the huge debt that is being built up in, in many uh, of the leading economies, I think, which will feature massively for all industrial sectors, including uh, shipping going forward. I think uh, after any world crisis, there is a release of huge forces for change. If you take the Second World War, which is often being compared to the, the last big world crisis alongside uh, uh, COVID-19, we had afterwards huge forces for change. If you look at the UK, uh, which I'm a, a citizen of, uh, you saw huge social welfare reform. You, sh you saw the, national, the birth of the, the National Health Service, huge forces for change coming into play. And I I think uh, post COVID-19, as we come out of this pandemic, we're going to see that as well. Some of those forces are positive. Some of them, of course, are negative as countries take new positions, as there is a, inevitably a, a shifting and a jockeying and a new world order uh, that comes into play. 
opportunities, business opportunities, political opportunities uh, are created and uh, destroyed in uh, equal measure. So I think post COVID-19 is going to be a very uncertain time to the extent that even talking about post COVID-19 is relevant because COVID-19 will live with us forever. It will be one of those factors that we will have to deal with. Shipping, as always, will have to nimbly tack uh, between these um, uh, prevailing winds. And, you know, I've no doubt seeing how we as a sector performed during uh, COVID-19 and continue to perform, not only with crew rotations, but also just with the, the logistics, we will cope with whatever uh, the world geopolitical situation uh, throws at us. I think you talked, Shadan, um, very, very sensibly at the beginning about um, the polarization of the, the situation uh, as we come out of this uh, uh, pandemic. And Espen also talked about the haves and the have-nots. There will be the haves and the haves not. There's huge discrepancy and differentiation between the nations and how different nations have coped and will cope with uh, the post pandemic uh, phase. There will be uh, the haves and the have-nots, the rich versus the poor, the the green uh, versus the not so environmentally friendly nations, the vaccinated uh, uh, versus the slow to be vaccinated nations. And I think this leads, all leads to a hugely febrile atmosphere. Uh, we're seeing this already uh, between countries. If you take the EU, take the UK, uh, relations are being strained where the issue of vaccination becomes so politically important. And I think that worries me the most as we go forward to the rest of this year and into next year, um, where there is this um, uh, fairness and unfairness uh, in the availability of, uh, of vaccines. So, uh, yes, the economic growths are positive. And I was surprised to read that, uh, you know, the, the US, uh, there will be precious little, if any, effect on uh, economic growth of COVID-19. I was extremely surprised uh, to read that, but I think the the, um, the the atmosphere going forward will be very, very uncertain. And, uh, you know, we'll have to deal with it as we deal with, with, with everything else. Thank you, Mark. You know, I, I think sometimes, uh, I, I think our level of efficiency in shipping uh, work perfect for us usually, and sometimes against us. And what our performance about the whole pandemic was, a, was a actually a kind of evidence of this. Uh, because you know we we perform shipping perform perfectly, but nobody know how much we suffered and how much our seafarers suffered, and how vaccination is important for the seafarers. Regardless, I mean it's important for all of us, but regardless their nationality, it is important for all the seafarers. So so I think we will we will see the kind of a you know regional approach, and some people maybe will try to make everything global again. So. Before I just move to the uh, Turkish shipping, is there anyone who wants to comment on this, like, you know, regional things versus the global and uh, how we are going to overcome this? Okay. Really? All right, so Sali Kaptan, the floor is yours and uh, your, your approach to macroeconomics and the competitiveness of Turkish shipping. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to be, nice, it's nice to be with you. So, before telling something about macroeconomics, it may worth to mention about Turkey shipping strong and weak sides. When we talk about weakness and strong, I generally start with the size of the fleet, etc. But there are also some underlying virtues which need to be analyzed further to get a sense as to why Turkish shipping evolved the way it did over the years. Let me start with the size as usual. Although I recently invested in larger tonnage, I'm a, I am the biggest advocate of coastal trade and short sea general cargo shipping in the region. So I should start with the strong short sea shipping potential. Most of the Turkish owners are more coastal trade trader oriented. But once owners manage to secure finance, or once the market yields surpass a certain threshold, warranting new investments, 
smaller owners tend to grow out of coastal traders as it is the case in most time so this serves as a good and niche base and helps us retain the upside potential we learn here playing with our smaller ships and apply what we have learned to bigger tonnage as a direct result of trial and error culture which is very common in our culture as well turkish owners much like greek owners started to build up the most important important survival skill resilience or in other words flexibility there are now many turkish companies that have survived several cycles there were only a handful of them some 25 years ago the new generation consisting of consisting of young daughters and sons of older companies has developed an eye and a nose for opportunities and the crisis so the good example of this we saw that many turkish owners at all segments started buying ships just before recent boom another aspect is vertical integration although this could sometimes be a disadvantage turkish owners prefer to centralize control over their fleet this is not very rewarding for a one two vessel fleet but increasing number of owners started to grow beyond five vessels and establish their own economies of scale. We have to thank our strong shipbuilding and repairs industry for this as well. We still need to learn more about advanced topics like bunker hedging, international ship management, and stock exchange, quality crewing, etc. But we are not falling too much behind. Moreover, we're still in need of learning a couple of things about cooperation, but still we have a shipping cluster. We do have a certain shipping culture in Turkey, and it is developing. We are, of course, considerably behind our Greek, Norwegian, British, Dutch counterparts. But again, increasing number of people are becoming shipping related. Any businessman with a good amount of time and money to risk has at least once considered investment into the industry. <clears throat> Some have really liked it and have since 10, 15 years remained in the picture. It is partly because shipping is due to its independence from specific shore-based crises could be more attractive economically for some. Finally, we need to touch on human resources aspect. We have a strong shipping education institutions and a large capacity at all ranks. But as I stated earlier, <clears throat> we need a bit more to do, actually start exporting this potential. Sadly and strangely, English as a foreign language is still a barrier we must tackle. Among the weakness, I can write, cite, smaller oral fleet compared to our competitors abroad. Our fleet is steadily growing, but is still comparably small, handy and larger vessels fleet. And all fleet relies on 70% of the all fleet dry cargo ships, consisting of dry cargo ships. So there is no big diversification in that respect. We are on the task, but we still lack international competitiveness in advanced fields like offshore energy, gas shipping, project and multi-purpose tonnage operations. Also, needless to mention that our short sea fleet is increasingly old. Turkey in the area, in the region, Turkish owners control one third of the total fleet trading in between Mediterranean, Mediterranean Black Sea, Europe and West Africa. And due to our geographical locations, competition from substandard shipping in the perimeter forces Turkish owners to find creative ways to cope with the competition. I take the opportunity to mention that overage short sea shipping is not only our issue, but is a general issue in the entire region. This is not an issue created by a number of owners trying to secure cheap financing to renew their ships. If sustainable funding for such ships cannot be developed, huge operating costs increases will become inevitable. 
Shipping demand is a drive demand, as all you as you all know. And if supply of tonnage is disrupted, especially for the small size, uh, I'm referring to the short sea shipping. In the events of a demand surge, freight levels will become unsustainable very quickly, which in fact it is the case nowadays started from beginning of the year that the, the freight levels on short, short CP shipping is also increasing because there is no new built ships coming in and the, the, the too many old ships are going for scrap. So in short, that is for now. If there would be any further question, I may clarify. I will be happy to clarify. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sadi Kaptan. Um, uh, the questions will be taken, uh, you know, at the last 15 minutes, 10 minutes of the of our panel. Uh, but I have to say that you know, Turkish ship owning community is growing, and it is is is, is I think also uh, resisting. Uh, I will say I think it is the correct word to the, all the crises and all the you know, ups and downs. And at the same time, uh, I, I'm very happy, I think you shared this uh, with me, Salih, is that you know, Turkey is becoming a shipping hub on the supply side as well. I mean, Turkish shipping is now much bigger than ship owners or ports or shipyards. And then we see that you know, we, uh, there is a momentum that you know our uh, supply industry, the supply chain industry, is also doing a great job. And right now we have one of the uh, leading uh, representative of them, and also he's uh, our board member in the EBA as well. Mustafa, would you like to see tell tell us your opinion about you know or your insight? Uh, as as Turkish, you know, one of the member of the Turkish uh, supply industry, specifically yeah. bankers, of course. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Shadan. It's difficult for me to speak after such uh, uh, shipping guys, but I will I will start with uh, reminding you, uh, IMO uh, latest IMO report, uh, giving us some numbers, which is very good. Uh, they calculated total bunker supply uh, volume around 219 million tons, basis 93% of no information they got from the ships over 500 GT. And if we, if we calculated up to 100% and including 5,000 over 5,000 uh, GT ships, we are reaching around 250,000 tons of. Uh, uh, 250 million tons of bunkers supplied every year to the world fleet. This is amounting around 120 million dollars, which means every every month, uh, 10 billion dollars bunkers given to ship owners. Uh, this is a very important ecosystem, and now it is going to change. For the time being, we have new regulation. 0.5 sulfur uh, uh, started by first. January 2020, and now we see 70% of bunkers, uh, bunker consumption is very low sulfur fuel oil, and 15% high sulfur fuel oil by scrubber, by the ships having scrubber on board, and 15% diesel. So we didn't see any uh, large increase on the diesel consumption, and we didn't see any large increase on the high sulfur. Number of scrubber ships are still still less, is is increasing. But we have point, uh, point 0.5 sulfur is a main bunker bunker product, which is not good enough for reaching IMO and uh, European EU uh, goals. We we want uh, emissions to be reduced down to uh, very low levels and zero in this center. So we are not okay with this kind of oils, and we have to find new fuels. We start with LNG, uh, which is very rapidly out now because it is it is not helping 100 percent for this emission goals so we have to find new new, new energies new fuels like ammonia hydrogen uh, many many things so the ecosystem and the supply chain is going to change very rapidly already for example MERS, the leading container line they have you know 740 ships and they said by 2023 they will start using emission-free oil, and by 2030, we have to have a certain reduction on the emissions. We have to use other, other, other oils. What we are going to use? 
So we don't really know. So if I am ship owner, I wouldn't buy any ship. I wouldn't order any ship. I don't know what I am going to burn in uh, in seven eight years time. So this is very much challenging uh, uh, per period, and it is really changing very fast. And we have to first ask if really this traditional uh, shipping companies like in Turkey or in Greece or in Europe, uh, what they are going to do if we can really manage this change. So we have to start talking about this change and we have to find some ways. For example, IMO must do some, some something further or BIMCO or the association or the ship owning association. We have to really do something new. It's going to change very fast. So at this Mustafa, stage, I would like to remind you this this main item. Then we can we can discuss that. Uh, we will be discussing that item actually. But uh, can I just ask you, as a, as a supply hub, how do you see Turkey now as it is? <clears throat> well, yes, we are. There are three thousand ports in the world every day, every hour, every minute. Bunker supplies are taking place. Istanbul is the number fourteenth biggest supply hub in the world. And we are second biggest in the area after Gibraltar. We are selling bunkers more than Russia, Romania, Bulgaria, Egypt, uh, Greece, Malta. Who, uh, in this area, we are second biggest, around 3 million tons. Of course, we got some uh, reduction, some decreases or due to pandemic. We are selling around 2.5 million tons. We are, we are ready for all kinds of oils. And we are also ready for LNG. There is a LNG terminal nearby Turkey, but nearby Istanbul. But who is going to build LNG bunker barge for $35 million? So, uh, so Mustafa, we are okay, me... we, are, we are supply hub, but we have, we have, I, I can't say anything right now for the new energies, for the new fuels. Okay, all right. Um, thank you. Um, I always believe that, you know, despite of we have very uh, esteemed guests here, that money should say the last word, which will okay. bring us to right. uh, Michael. And uh, so what is the current trends? And uh, also, I know that you have uh, quite an experience with Turkish ship owners. And, and if you just, you know, give your insight on this as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sadan, and thanks to Marie Money, of course, for uh, organizing this because it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be back uh, talking to the to the Turkish community again, and we look forward, of course, to an actual seminar next year on the Bosporus and, and meet everybody face to face. To your question, Sadan, on the uh, investor sentiment, I think we've we've seen actually an extraordinary 18 months uh, when it comes to investors' view to the shipping markets. Um, for the last decade, uh, shipping was definitely considered by the financial investors as a typical loss-making industry or not generating sufficient returns, intransparent, polluting, and people actually, investors, preferred other sectors. Now, I think a number of those concerns are definitely still in place. Um, the, 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 the polluting argument, and I think we're going to talk a bit later on environmental more specifically Saddam uh, but uh, on, on, on the environmental uh, um, uh, concerns that investors may have I think shipping is actually very well positioned to 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 show and table the steps it's actually making in becoming a clean industry and, and should do a much better PR job uh, in, in conveying that message because a lot of things are happening and investors need to fund that trend um, and, and, and the industry needs to get that message across to investors. I think the reputation is worse than the reality and the trend. Also on the transparency, the Suez uh, incident again shows that shipping is often in the news when something bad happens. When everything goes right, the, 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 the stores are filled with, with goods, the factories are, are filled with uh, supplies. No one talks about shipping. But when, when there's a lack of transportation because of a sewage incident or at the start of COVID when there was a hiccup in the, in the ports, everybody suddenly notices, hey, we lack, we lack the cargo, we lack the goods. So shipping, um, ship, shipping should convey its positive message much better to the investor community that it's a vital industry to, uh, 
to provide the services. And when there is an incident like in Suez, that is actually clear who's the owner of the ship. Uh, someone gets to the press, explain uh, what's being done. The third concern that people typically have in the past is the lack of uh, profitability of the industry. Now here, the COVID uh, situation, of course, showed that uh, shipping has actually responded with uh, tremendous resiliency to, uh, to what we saw at the start of the pandemic. Um, of course, there were, there were certainly uh, dips in, uh, in, in rates immediately after the COVID uh, pandemic uh, started to, uh, to become a global pandemic. But quite quickly, uh, rates, uh, of course, improved, and especially on the container side, they have been uh, um, at levels that we have not uh, not seen in the last decade. So I think the investor community is now looking at shipping with interest. It's being noticed. Of course, the tanker markets are still lagging behind, but it's noticed that shipping is actually a profitable sector and worth investing in. And the ongoing demand for cargo is there to support that. Um, of course, the supply side has been the, uh, the, the, the key reason why the last decade has been so challenging. And now the supply side uh, clearly has improved. The, picture, the supply picture is, has, has improved tremendously. Mustafa talked about the, um, the, the doubts that you may have as an owner. What kind of ships do I order? Because who knows what kind of uh, fuels are required in eight years time. It's actually those doubts and concerns that actually help uh, the, the, the short term, medium term uh, freight rate outlook because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, yeah, the fact that supply will remain limited. So let's hope the industry can, uh, can remain disciplined in, uh, in, in, in keeping that supply sensible. Although you see, of course, now the container vessel orders uh, increasing again. But summarizing, typically when we as Saudi say talk to investors about the industry, Try to get new money into, into the sector. The investor community typically finds shipping a difficult industry to understand. But it's starting to see that relative to the typically more safe hubs like commercial real estate, aviation, which was until 18 months ago much easier to attract uh, funding into, suddenly they see, hey, uh, there's more resilience in the shipping industry than we thought uh, there would be, and it's worth investing in. So important to keep explaining the industry properly to the investor community and help them to, to fund the ESG trends rather than to stay on the sideline. Now, moving on to, uh, I'm conscious of time as well, moving on to Turkey specifically. Here again, uh, I think that the Turkish shipping industry has a lot, um, has a lot to go for. There's a, Tremendous amount of operational expertise in the, amongst the Turkish uh, operators. There's a tremendous amount of asset expertise, uh, also supported, of course, by the uh, by the yard business and the repair yard business, which is uh, which is of course uh, flourishing in uh, in Turkey. Um, also, in my previous uh, banking job, we've had a lot of good experiences in dealing with uh, with Turkish ship owners, cost competitive as well. Um, so I think also there, uh, Turkish owners should be well positioned to bring in institutional uh, investor money. Of course, the, the key concern there could be uh, a country risk, uh, political risk concern. So it ha definitely has to be mitigated to the structure uh, of an investment proposition. Uh, but operationally, uh, I think the Turkish community uh, should be well positioned to also attract investor funding. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, when I started to ship the country there and then it disappeared and the cycling of this nature and also in the middle of uh, one of my, you know, again, my career, the, nobody likes shipping and then, you know, out of a sudden they like shipping and then they hate shipping, you know, so uh, you know, we have a cyclic uh, business, but also our, you know, the, the, the mood against the world towards us or the country is also changing. So, and I, I just want to hope that, you know, uh, if we take our lessons, as you say, uh, Michael, then maybe we go, can go as not only Turkish shipping, but as a whole to a better future. And I think in the better future, we have to fulfill our responsibilities for environment. And I cannot think of anyone better than Esben 
and I know you will hate me because of this, but to actually set a scene <laughs> and uh, what is happening now and what are the challenges um, uh, on, on that front? Esmond, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, Sadan, um, you know, to me, the move towards uh, tomorrow's fuel is a race and, and a race is a good thing because it, it gets everybody engaged and the prize is tremendous. So at the moment, um, you look around you, the, some of the big companies you mentioned, Master Early and others, are, are really going for this in a, in a big way. And I, I make the analogy, if you look at the vaccine, who was it that did it? It was private industry. Who is going to solve this issue? It's going to be private industry, in my opinion. If we wait for regulation, especially global regulation, it won't happen. We have to do it. And I would say that the whole momentum is well on the way now. I think there really are things happening every day. You hear something new and somebody trying something new. The R&D funding that's going into this issue it is just enormous and growing. From an industry perspective, we came up, as you know, with our R&D fund, five billion. Uh, this is two dollars per ton of, of the fuel consumed. It took us three years to do it, working as a unified industry with BFMCO, ourselves, you know, industry did it, but it took three years because there were a lot of opinions on it. And what happens? We get to the MIMO, very positive about this. And then you get countries saying, well, you know, we're not sure about this. And, yeah, we don't really like this and that. And all of a sudden, oh, you know, it's MABC, it'll be the next one. And I think this is a pity because I think what, what, what I've said to several governments I've spoken to is we get grief from you about how terrible we all are in shipping, we don't do this and that. We then come with something concrete that we have done 100% of our own bad based on our Paris Agreement on, uh, on shipping of 2018, which again, we came up with. And, and yet we run into opposition. So I, I find this very, very disheartening. But nonetheless, I'm not saying that this $5 billion fund is the panacea, not at all. What I'm saying is that it's a catalyst an indication of what the industry is willing and ready to do as a step. But it's one of many steps. And whether it's the Mass McKinney Foundation in Copenhagen, whether it's uh, here in Singapore, we have a report coming out in a few weeks time, next week actually, on uh, by the International Advisory Panel on the future of this. And this report will have some very, I was on the committee, so I, I, I know what's in it. And there'll be some very, the innovative and big things in, in that report. And th these are just examples. But if if we as industry work together on this and, and rather than just looking at it competitively, collaboratively, where possible, uh, I have no doubt that we will get there. Thank you, Aswin. I think, you know, uh, the, you know, we shipping associations always work, you know, closely. And thanks to pandemic, we start to develop a very different chemistry. And uh, that's why I just can say that, you know, in shipping, I know it is very competitive. And sometimes when I speak, then I see notes or, you know, comments saying that, uh, why are you so collaborative? Why are you so trying to unify? Because this is bigger than an individual. So we have to be united on this. And I absolutely agree with you uh, that will the solutions will come from the private sector. And I and then of course we will continue to support our research and development fund. Hopefully, you know, IMO is our you know temple. Uh, but as you know, when you go into a temple, sometimes when you go out, you're a different person. Let's hope that this time, you know, we will succeed. Uh, but under any circumstances, you know, I think we have no choice than you know working on this together. And Mark, you've been working with a lot of ship owners. And uh, what is the sentiment there? And uh, what is your, you know, thoughts on this, you know, the challenge? I, I think um, uh, l listening to what everything's been said, I think that the wonderful thing about shipping and what we have to preserve and ensure we continue with is our flexibility and our nimbleness. And if you look at uh, 
when I was a lawyer, I had some uh, wonderful friends and clients in Turkey, yourself included, Shad, and I'm, I'm very pleased to count, count you as, uh, uh, as both of those when I, when I was a lawyer. And I was amazed at how uh, flexible the Turkish yards that were uh, involved primarily in shipbuilding prior to 2008 adjusted to the uh, to the 2008 financial crisis and then took up uh, repairs and uh, refitting have done so amazingly successfully well and now are back into the uh, very successfully in the, the shipbuilding uh, model as well so whether it's yards or whether it's shipping it's this flexibility uh, and agility what will change the drivers for change going forward though I, I believe uh, is shareholder, uh, shareholder, whether it is political shareholder, stock value, or commercial. The, the it's not just commercial because populations, having gone through this whole pandemic, have had the opportunity to think about what is really important. I can tell you now. I can give you a little anecdote. Yesterday morning, our chairman came into uh, the office and and threw onto my desk a lot of plastic mugs that were sitting beside the coffee machine and he said it's not acceptable anymore get rid uh you know everything has to be sustainable we have a sustainability policy everything has to be recyclable there is a huge engagement now across the world from all uh, through all generations in environmental issues and i think that will translate from the political stockholder shareholder into the commercial uh, stockholder shareholder and we will have to change with it the problem we have in shipping is that our assets uh, are have a 25 20 25 year life cycle and the powertrain in those assets are not interchangeable if we could simply pull out a diesel engine and replace it with a hydrogen powered engine or an electricity powered engine or an ammonia powered engine there would be no problem and the shipping industry would warmly hug uh, the Greta Thunbergs of this world and say absolutely we're with you completely but we have to kick the design the technology uh, to catch up with uh, the political opinion and also the commercial opinion. We need to change the asset and the flexibility of our assets because if we do that, we can swap and change and interchange and, and be the most environmental uh, of industry sectors. That's the challenge, design. And uh, if you get that right, then uh, you make uh, the industry very flexible and very nimble. And I think that will happen going forward. That's the challenge. But I think it's, uh, Mark, it's, it can only be a gradual process. Uh, you cannot change the fleet uh, within a few years. It needs to be gradual, step by step. And that's something which, um, there's a difference between what is realistic and what does the public want to see. And the public, of course, wants to see a quick solution, which is simply not possible. Um, the public needs to understand, and also the investors need to understand, it's it's the trend uh, towards a, a more environment-friendly industry, uh, which is relevant here. It's the steps that you need to take in order to get there. And you need to do it indeed together, together with the cargo holders, together with the investors, together with the banks, together with the yards. Um, but ultimately, everybody needs to understand it's gradual. And that's that. I think. Do we, do um, we really think? Do we really think that the 2050 will stand as a a, a, a stop date? Uh, I don't. Uh, I, 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 I until the U.S. election, uh, I thought I thought the whole environmental drive was in question, where economies need to rebuild, and and chances are the environmental answer is the more expensive answer, and therefore may take second place. But now the world is a very different place, and I think 2050 will be pulled forward considerably. I really do not think public opinion, world public opinion, will allow 2050 to uh, to stand. I think we'll have to uh, drive our designers ever harder to come up with solutions, and they will. I, I think, uh, thank you so much uh, for this comment, but I think, you know, what is um, the strength and the weakness of the shipping is that we always comply. We always comply. If there is a deadline, we comply. We find a way, we comply. And and I, I, I this is like a chicken and egg situation. I think, as well, maybe you feel the same because you know, we we will for, you know, of course, the private sector will do this, but also the the communities. Everybody should understand us, and this should be gradual. So that's why we call it uh, complex. 
uh, as well. Would you like to comment on this further? Well, I, I think just to give an example of what you're talking about, the January 2020, 0.5% sulfur, I think that just, just shows you because leading up to that, uh, you know, many people believed it was simply technically and physically impossible and there was going to be doomsday and, and so on. And, and you know, it, the day came and of course there were some problems, but in relative terms, it was just nothing like uh, what so many people had uh, forecast. So your point is, I, I, is absolutely correct. I mean, Dallas Water Convention, 14 years in the making, uh, started in a laboratory. Um, that's an example of how not to develop regulation and that's our role you and I as industry um, spokespersons to, to try and, and um, somehow or other prevail on, on, on people who very often are not qualified to actually analyze these things for, because they're politically driven. So, but, but nonetheless, that is our job to, to go and try and, and make sure that the future regulation is works, that it's proven not in a, in a laboratory, but in, in, in real life. And um, easier said than done, but that is, uh, you're right, your point is correct, that, that we always do comply and we always do get there. And I think this will bring me uh, to another uh, aspect of Turkish shipping, because Saudi Kaplan is, uh, is I, would, I, I, I think it's not wrong me to say that you are the father of the, our, you know, coastal renewal, uh, our coastal fleet renewal project. So, and, and uh, we have that, you know, the project is there, you are working on it with the Chamber of Shipping, all with all your colleagues. And uh, what are the recent developments? Because there is so much uncertainty now uh, regarding the new fuels and the sustainability. So what is your opinion on this? Yeah, Shadan, thank you very much. In fact, I have no objection that uh, uh, I like the idea even to run ships with clean energy, with new engine type of engines. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of finance, matter of uh, initiation, substitutions or sponsorships <clears throat> provided by the international community or local states. So we have, uh, in, in that respect, in our community, we are on the, on the weak side. So in our project, when it comes to renewal of the coastal fleet trading in this area, aging something 27 years old. So since years, we are trying to convince the authorities to get the reasonable finance, long-term project finance, to, re to renew the ships in our shipyards, where, where, are, where are the possibilities and facilities are very much uh, convenient for this project. But the, the Main problem is the finance, long-term project finance. And with this, we, we just figure out the project as present equipment prices, steel prices and engine prices. So difficulty will be, I mean, everything, every project has a feasibility to invest. So even this present feasibility at present freight levels doesn't seem attracting. So when we see that there will be new technology to be applied, new regulation for environment to be applied on the ships, then money will talk. Who is going to compensate, compensate or uh, give chance to the owners to, to carry out the project? So just a small example, even now we have this project on the table, that uh, we are just getting offers for total equipment. Main item is the engine sets. But with the conventional engine type presently we used on board, it's about for the 6,000 dead weight toner to be more specific. It is costing something 1 million US dollar. But I approach to this new technology chance, think that we have to face the reality in the future that we may, if we may invest on the new technology like battery powered chips or LNG powered engines, something, then cost is increasing three times more than about 3 million euros, even not dollars. So the problem is there. So this should be handled or could not be handled by local or individual ship owners and individual countries. It's a global issue and the global solution should be there to overcome and to cope with this problem. 
Otherwise, ideally, we all like the idea. We have to have a green environment, better air, and a good future for this uh, for the next generations. But the problems are there, so we should all work together. All international shipping community should work together to cope with or to overcome this problem and invest for the better. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I think we have to be a little bit, you know, faster. But um, Mustafa, you already mentioned you start with the different fuels and the challenges. Would you like to wrap it up with, you know, for Turkish uh, supply hub, uh, what might happen and what are the new type of, you know, fuels according to your mind? As quick as possible, please. Thank yes, you. thank you very much. I was just going to say after uh, Saleh Abi. Uh, Yes, we are talking about new ships, new designs, new oils. But in the meantime, can you imagine crew? We have to do everything. As Esben said, we have to do everything. Can you imagine crew keeping hydrogen minus 280 degrees? Can, can you imagine how, how, how you can manage your ship? How you can educate this crew on board? So it's, it's a totally, totally different world. And regarding yes, Turkish uh, Turkey being you know supply hub, it's not only bunkering, but you know we do supply provisions, water, lube oil. We have the uh, I think the longest list in lube oil supplies, for example, every single uh, uh, brand available here. So we are going to change uh, in line with the shipping industry. Uh, you know, Turkish people, we are very very creative. We are hard workers. We, we will be supplying your ships, don't worry, but I don't know what we are going to supply. The, <laughs> uh, the, the certain issue for our area is if Mediterranean Black Sea and Agency becoming ECA soon, this means uh, actually it's good for us. We will be converting to diesel 0.1 gas oil only. This is really very clean and very easy, very easy for the operations, for the suppliers. So I think that the area, if, Full Mediterranean will be booming. I mean, we will be supplying much more volume to the international shipping once we are we are ECA. I mean, all together. I can't say Mediterranean only. We have to be all together uh, Black Sea, Aegean, and Mediterranean. Otherwise, you can't imagine any ship burning fuel oil in Black Sea, but gas oil in Mediterranean. It doesn't work. So I think this is the next step by 2025. If we are going to ECA, we will supply diesel. Then you know we will work on uh, different fuels. But it's not only, as Salih Abi said, it's not only our our issue. It's a global issue, including crew, including supply chain, including you know everything, new design, uh, engines, and su uh, suppliers, supply barges, and everything. So Thank this you, will, I think, bring us back again to the money. You know, yes. it's unbelievable how we always go around and around and come I to money. So uh, Michelle, you can leave some billions here and we will just, you know, <laughs> do it for you. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, uh, so, the suppliers, uh, everybody ready here. So leave, uh, leave, your, leave your Before finance. we start to raise money, let's ask what is the, you know, current trend and how the ship owners and builders and we all together can finance, finance this uh, change which is a revolutionary change, actually. So, Michael, please. Yeah. No, thanks, Iran. It's Of course, the uh, majority of it is, is already covered in my previous answer. Eh? There is, I think, shipping really has the ability now that finally the, the industry is turning more profitable to become um, more attractive uh, to investors. It, it can also tackle uh, the transparency and the environmental agenda that, that investors may have. And on the env environmental side, I'm convinced that with with the right with the right designs that are that are going to take the industry to the next level, um, which uh, which is going to, going to support the green trend, there is a lot of funding available, not only from commercial players, but of course also from sovereign players. There's a lot of funding available for for for, for green concepts, and the industry needs to be, be able to capture that. And, and I'm looking at Kevin as well. It's uh, but if you if you if you allow me another few seconds, Kevin, then and the industry should should be able to capture that uh, that green funding with the green agenda, which is currently made available, and and for that an, a unified, aligned approach, working together, yards, owners, cargo, 
um, with the same trend objectives, that is, in my view, the path to, uh, to getting hold of those uh, necessary investments. Thank you. Well, thank you all of you. Uh, from my perspective, it was an honor to, you know, to moderate this panel. Very nice to see you all. And I think we are a little bit over time. And uh, I will leave the floor to Kevin now. Yeah, thank you, Shadan. Thank you to everyone for a great uh, discussion. We, I got limited to two questions. One more, one sort of a Istanbul-related question, and one kind of global-related question. Uh, this one is to uh, Mustafa, please. Um, the question is: Do you think that the Chamber of Shipping, perhaps in coordination with local or national authorities like Istanbul City Municipality or the Ministry of Transportation, could consider investing in an LNG bunker barge, which could be built in Turkish yards and used to um, for, 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 for LNG supplies in the Istanbul area? Is that a possibility? This is what we are actually discussing. I visit Botaş. We have a LNG monopoly in Turkey uh, under, uh, under state control company called Botaş. They are really, I, I, I see physically, uh, they have an installation near Istanbul, which is very good. It's, it's just you know, a few hours sailing to, uh, to, to the supply locations. Yes, this is the project, actually. I, I already offered our chamber to work on it. You know, maybe Gispir, our uh, shipyard association, our shipping association, and the Botash and the government and the ministry, they, they come together. But building one, one bunker barge is really nothing for the time being. For example, in Istanbul, we have 60 plus barges supplying bunker fuels. Yes, we have to start somewhere. Yes, we need bunker yeah. bar, uh, LNG barge. This is a good model. We are already talking about it. This is already offered to the related parties. Hopefully, we will we will have something soon. Okay, great, thank you. And and a final a final question, which um, I think it can be uh, addressed to Esben and uh, to Mark, and then we'll fi we'll finish with Shadan if you don't mind. Um, the the person asking the question said he was very impressed with the film which Bimco put out a few months ago. I think the film was called Ships Make the World Go Around. I too, I thought it was a great uh, film highlighting the uh, importance of seafarers. And also, Mikhail, earlier on, you mentioned uh, we need to do a better PR job as an industry and we have to get the message across. Uh, I interestingly read uh, in Lloyd's List, I think it was, uh, when, when the Suez crisis was going on, it was an article called, No News is Sometimes Bad News, because actually that issue in the Suez Canal highlighted the importance of shipping, although it was, it was a negative thing on, on the one hand for shipping, on the other hand, it highlighted how vital shipping in is in terms of getting goods uh, to the, um, to, you know, to, 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 the, to the places they have to go to. So the question is, um, how is, what is the best way to get this message across to the general public? We're all saying that, you know, the kind of uh, the, the, the uh, endeavor to go green and virus being forced on us, not by everybody, but including the general par public. How, to, how can we get the shipping message? across that we are making an effort and we are doing a good job. Esben, two minutes, please. Well, I, I can tell you this is something that uh, I've heard this uh, in, on the 31st of August this year, I will have been in shipping for 50 years. And all those years I've heard about our terrible image and you only hear about shipping when the Eric or the Prestige goes down or when the <laughs> Mocha Cadiz and birds covered in oil. That's the only thing you, you ever hear about in the shipping or in this case, the ever given in the Suez, and, and that is unfortunately true, but and I always swore to myself that if I ever got anywhere in their position where I could actually try and do something about this, I would. And so in ICS, we have now two full-time uh, communications people. That's, that's two more than we had two years ago, by the way. And we have uh, arrangements with uh, external agencies and so forth. And what we're trying to do and have tried to do is reach beyond the, the, the maritime press. No disrespect to you, Kevin, but you know we're we're trying to 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 engage in the, the maritime press. And we had a case actually where uh, we managed to get the crew change issue onto the front page of the Financial Times. And the transport minister of Singapore, Corbyn Wan, said to me, reading that article, he decided Singapore had to do something. And mm. you know this just shows you the the power of, of a media of, of that of that kind. So. The problem is we're starting from a very, very low base, but I know BIMCO have communications people and many of our national association members have them, uh, and, and so we should. But the thing is that we cannot solve this problem overnight because, as I said, we're coming from a base of nowhere where, you know, single purpose companies were 
you know, hiding behind beneficial ownership. Those days, thankfully, are long gone. And people are now fronting up, you know, if people do something, they are there. You saw that with the Ever Given. No one tried to, to hide that ownership and so on. So, yeah. you know, we're on the right track, but it will take time. Uh, but I do believe we're on the right track. Thank you. Mark, uh, two minutes from you, perhaps? Yeah, in, in the old days when uh, people, when navies tried to get people to go to sea they press gang them certainly in in the uk and back in the 18th 16th 16th 17th 18th centuries you know we have to change our approach and uh, uh i i think if if i asked my kids uh, to tell me a bit about shipping they wouldn't have the faintest idea because there is no pr whatsoever all of the associations uh, uh ics bimco intertango intermanager all of us were all guilty perhaps guilty is the wrong word of inward looking serving only our me direct members interests we have to look a little bit perhaps come together uh, combine our resources and look outward and and you know tell the message put the put put some spin and some excitement uh, onto the message that shipping is an incredibly important and rewarding career, be it commercial, operational, finance, science, travel. It's a fantastic career and it needs to be recognized as that. And it's also an incredibly important part of our overall uh, worldwide trade. We all need to come together and look out a little bit more and not necessarily through the uh, the UN institutions, the regulatory institutions, perhaps the focus is too much on those and, and we need to actually look out and t tell the message from our sure. combined platform. Thank you. And Shadan, last word uh, to you, please. I mean, the Bimbico film, I, th I thought it was great, but perhaps it was only shipping people who saw it. How do we get the message out to the wider world? Well, to, to be honest with you, Kevin, it was not the only shipping people, uh, but we were very much surprised that how shipping people emotionally need something like that because their response was also great but we had a great response from the outside and uh, now BIMCO is preparing to actually the uh, to give a report but what I can say is that uh, that you know uh, usually our website is is you know visited by like four to five thousand people max mm -hmm. and it went mm -hmm. to up to sixty thousand Right. And uh, and also, you know, as as been say very rightfully, you know, in in the old way, in the old days, shipping was very much reserved. But we don't think this way anymore. And ICS has a strategy. Bimco has a strategy. In the roundtable, we have a joint kind, you know, almost a strategy. And and we are changing this. And the, from the Bimco perspective, what we do is, for example, I was in the the Economics World Shipping Summit. You know, this was the first for BIMCO. Uh, dear Sabrina Cha, she was in the World Economic Forum. And then we made the movie. Why we made the movie? Because now, 21st century, people like to watch things instead of read things. And, mm -hmm. and the movies will continue. And also, we are uh, intentionally targeting non-shipping uh, platforms in order to uh, represent us and change the perception. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Kevin. Shana. Maybe just to, uh, just yeah, to add, uh, and I know it's brief. Um, within the industry, there is a front runner when it comes to PR, and that's the liner industry. If you follow the liners on, on LinkedIn and on their website, there is an active communication of also the positive news to the crowd, to the public. And the public does pick that up. So the liner industry is able to actually um, inform the general Mike, public on the steps it makes. Go into any high street in Germany or in England or wherever yeah. else. You know, have you heard of Mask? You'd you'd be lucky. Uh, maybe one or two had. Uh, to Mask to us is like, of course they have. Most people have know nothing about shipping. Even uh, the giants like Mask. It, it's uh, we have a lot of work to do. We really do. Yeah, sure. But there there is an active, proactive uh, communication of of the steps they are making, and of course it ends. The message will end up the desk the people that want to listen to it, of course. I, I, I think it's fair to uh, say that we, ha we have a consensus that we have to do more and we are doing more and we will be doing more. And because it is the time and the momentum is behind us. So I really thank you. And then we will collaborate as usual, as always. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank you all for a wonderful uh, discussion. Shadan, thank you very much. Uh, Esben, Mikhil, Mark, Mustafa, and Salih. A great discussion. And uh, like I said, right at the beginning, we hope that we'll be able to reconvene in Istanbul uh, in about a year from now. It'll be wonderful. Absolutely. So all thank right. you. Thanks.
Thank you very much. So we're going to thank you. Thank you. Thank we're going to reconvene again in in, uh, in uh, 45 minutes um, for our third session. The third session has a closer look at shipping finance options in 2021. Uh, so if you're interested, see you then. Thank you very much. Thanks very thank much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.